This is Physics 1060, Descriptive Astronomy, Lecture 6. We're going to continue talking about the terrestrial planets, particularly Mars, Venus, and Mercury. So let's start with the closest planet, Mercury. Its radius is about a third of the Earth, and its mass is a twentieth of the Earth. And so gravity is about one-third of that on the Earth. So our 180-pound guy again would weigh about 60 pounds on the surface of Mercury. There's circular craters that cover the surface, with the largest one being Caloris Basin with a diameter of 1,300 kilometers. And unlike the moon, where they are formed almost exclusively in Mariah, congealed lava flows are found in many of Mercury's old craters and pave a lot of its surface. Since Mercury is so difficult to see, how do we know what the surface is like? Well, there's lots of different methods. One is to look at its albedo, which is the fraction of sunlight that hits the surface and is reflected. A mirror has a 100% albedo, and a black cloth has a 0% albedo. There's some particularly interesting surface features on Mercury. One of them is called a scarp. So a scarp or a cliff forms as Mercury cools and shrinks, like the wrinkling of a dried apple. And we can see here that this crater formed before the scarp formed, since we can still see the cliff in it. So then we can get some timelines by looking at different features and when these different features formed. Another is something that astronomers have dubbed weird terrain. It's a feature directly opposite of the Chloris Basin, and it was probably caused by seismic waves generated by the impact that created that huge crater. It's just this rough, lineated hilly area that they just they didn't know what to call it so they just called it weird. So the hilly and lineated terrain is caused by the shock wave from the impact of the crater. As the impact and we get surface waves that go around, compressed waves that go through and they all jumble up here on the opposite side and form this hilly and lineated terrain. Now Mercury's noon temperature at the equator is about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, and its nine time temperature is 280 degrees below zero, over a thousand degrees difference between day and night. These extremes result from Mercury's proximity to the Sun and its lack of atmosphere. Its low mass and proximity to the Sun do not allow Mercury to retain an atmosphere of any significance, and its lack of volcanoes suggests that Mercury never had a significant atmosphere. Only recently we've discovered there were some trace amounts of some gases using spectroscopy as dominated by sodium. The wavelength of light given in the figure is specific to the light given off by sodium. Now, other elements in this atmosphere include traces of hydrogen, helium, oxygen, and argon. Helium is a big surprise since it's so light and should easily escape Mercury's gravity field. It is thought that what's really happening is it's constantly being replaced by the solar wind, which we'll discuss later. Now, this atmosphere is not much. It's only about a billionth of the Earth's. So even if we stood on the surface, you'd have to have really special instruments to detect that there was any atmosphere. Now, Mercury's poles are always very cold, enough so that small ice caps exist there perhaps the result of a comet impact that created gaseous water that drifted to the poles and froze out. Mercury's, Mercury has a very high average density, and it suggests that its interior is iron-rich, with only a thin rock or silicate mantle. Now, two possible reasons for a thin silicate surface. Silicates do not condense as easily as iron in the hot inner solar nebula where Mercury formed and the rocky crust was blasted off by an enormous impact, is another hypothesis. If you look at the cross-section, it's mostly its iron-nickel core, a little bit of a mantle. So again, here we have another large impact hypothesis. Maybe a little bit thicker rocky mantle, something large struck, and as it struck, it uh, essentially destroys the planet, uh, the iron is all liquid, sticks together, the other materials are round. Um, so as it comes together, it differentiates again, but most of the rock is gone, leaving only the iron core. 
Now, Mercury has a very weak magnetic field, probably due to its small molten core, its slow rotation rate, and the field may simply be that of its solid nickel-iron core is like a huge permanent magnet, but would be much weaker than the dynamo-created magnet on the Earth. Now, Mercury spins very slowly with a side reel rotation period of 58 and change Earth days, which is exactly two-thirds of its orbital period around the Sun of about 88 days. Consequently, Mercury spins three times every two trips around the Sun. It's in a locked tidal rotation with the Sun, by at a hill pointing towards the Sun. As it goes around, two-thirds of the way around, it's going to be pointing in the same direction with respect to the background stars. When it comes back around to the same position in space, it's going to be pointing in the opposite direction. And then as it goes around again, the second time would be pointing in the second direction. Such a ratio of periods is called a resonance. Mercury's resonance is a result of the Sun's tidal force on Mercury and its very complicated elliptical orbit. The Sun cannot lock Mercury into a synchronous one-to-one -one rotation because of the high eccentricity of Mercury. So because of this, Mercury's solar day is 176 Earth days long. Its day is longer than its year of 88 days. So because of Mercury's slow rotation near perihelion, the Sun will briefly reverse direction in the Hermitian sky. Now, Mercury is in between us and the Sun. And because of that, we will see it transit across the surface of the Sun every few years. On average, there are 13 transits of Mercury each century. This picture shows uh, many pictures taken on a time delay as Mercury goes across the surface of the Sun. Now, Venus, we'll see, has transits that occur in pairs that have a century separating each pair. This picture is of the 2003 transit, and it lasted five hours. Only one spacecraft has flown by Mercury, Mariner 10, in 1974-75. Now there's another mission called MESSENGER that was launched on August 3rd, 2004. <clears throat> it reached Mercury for a flyby in 2008 and went into orbit in 2011. Now why so long? It actually takes much more energy to fly toward the Sun than it does away from it. Now, MESSENGER sent us lots of great images of the surface of Mercury. Here we can see the craters. In fact, in this crater here, we can see the little mountain peak that occurs in the middle of it after that happens. We can see craters on top of craters, um, and you just start to see what the surface of Mercury looks like. Here's some pictures of that weird terrain close up taken by MESSENGER. Here's another MESSENGER image where you see this crater have some different materials, so you can see some different colors. We can actually see the rays from the ejected material off of this crater. And another crater that you can see the bright rays that go across the other craters around it. Notice again the hill in the center of it. We don't know much more about Mercury, so let's move on to Venus. Venus has a mass and diameter very close to Earth. However, the two planets have radically different surfaces and atmospheres. Here's a picture of the moon in the background with Venus. This is either slightly um, before, uh, slightly after sunset or slightly before sunrise. Now reflected spectra and spacecraft measurements show the Venetian atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide, a little bit of nitrogen, and small amounts of water and other gases. The winds on the surface of Venus exceed 200 miles an hour. There's a lot of energy in the atmosphere. The nice pretty clouds that we see on Venus are actually sulfuric acid droplets with a little bit of water. The clouds are very high and thick. They range from 30 to 60 kilometers above the surface, and so we really can't see the surface to the clouds. Some sunlight penetrates to the surface and appears as tinged orange due to the clouds absorbing all the blue wavelengths. The atmosphere is extremely dense reaching pressures about a hundred times that of the Earth's, 
which would be like being under 3,000 feet of water for a similar pressure. So the lower atmosphere is very hot, with temperatures up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's enough to melt lead. Spacecraft again have landed on Venus, but do not survive long because of the harsh conditions. Why is Venus so hot? The answer is the greenhouse effect, a process that explains why the interiors of cars actually get so hot in the sunshine. In a greenhouse, light can travel through the glass and heat the plants inside. As the plants radiate infrared radiation, <clears throat> that balances the heat they receive. But glass is opaque to infrared radiation, so it gets trapped inside the greenhouse, so the temperature rises. On Venus, the carbon dioxide atmosphere takes place of the, ga of the gas, glass. So, visible light can go through the atmosphere, heats up the surface, but as the infrared tries to go out, it bounces around and comes back down. So the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the more heating there will be. The Earth has much less carbon dioxide than Venus, but the amount of CO2 is raising because of burning of fuel that contains carbon, so things like burning wood, coal, or oil. This is the danger of global warming that there is a lot of publicity about right now. Now ground features of Venus can be mapped with radar from Earth and spacecraft that are orbiting it, since radar can penetrate the clouds. Venus's surface is less mountainous and rugged than the Earth, with most of its surface as low, gentle, rolling plains. Here's a computer-generated image um, by taking the topography from uh, orbiting satellites that have mapped the surface. And you can see we get some hills, some volcanic-looking structures, but basically it's kind of low, smooth plains. There are only two major highlands, Ishtar Terra and Aphrodite Terra and about 80% of the surface rise above the plains to form last mass, land masses similar to our continents. If Venus had water, it would be mostly water with just these two small land masses sticking up. It doesn't have any water because of its high temperature. Ishtar Terra is about the size of Greenland and is studded with volcanic peaks. Maxwell Monts the highest is 11 kilometers above the average level of the planet, which would be the equivalent sea level reference. Radar maps have shown many puzzling features, or maybe some lack thereof of some features. There's very few plate tectonic pictures, features, continental blocks, crustal rifts, trenches at plate boundaries. There are a few distorted impact craters and crumbled mountains. Volcanic landforms dominate the surface. Peaks from immense land lava flows, blisters of uplifted rock, and grids of long narrow faults, particularly lumpy terrain. In particular, one of the things they see is things called lava domes, where it's this upwelling of lava that creates a dome structure on the surface. We also see these features that indicate a young and active surface. Venus's original surface has been destroyed by volcanic activity. The current surface is not more than 500 million years old, much younger than the Earth's, with some regions less than 10 million years old. Now, we have not directly observed volcanic eruptions. We see some lava flows that appear fresh. We certainly see electrical discharges on Venus, indicative of eruptions and there's brief increases in the amount of sulfur content that's also indicative of volcanic eruptions. There are numerous volcanic peaks, domes, and uplifted regions suggest that heat flows less uniformly within Venus than Earth. We get hot spot generation of volcanoes, and those dominate on Venus, which is not the case of Earth. Venus is not Earth's twin. The interior of Venus is probably very similar to Earth, iron, core, and rock mantle. Venus still is evolving into a, a, is still evolving into the smooth heat flow and patterns found on Earth. Earth rocks have more trapped water in them, making Earth rocks runnier than Venetian rocks, and the Earth crust thinner, which allows easier cracking of the crust into plates for tectonic movements. 
These are pictures of the first images from the surface of Venus from the Russian spacecraft Venera. It landed showing a barren surface with flat broken rocks and lit by pale orange sunlight. Sampling also indicated the rocks were volcanic. Radar measurements show Venus is the slowest rotating planet, taking 243 Earth days to rotate once, and its spin is actually retrograde or backward from the rest of the planets. There's two possible causes for this slow retrograde rotation. One, Venus was struck shortly after its birth by a huge planetesimal. And two, tidal forces from the Sun and perhaps Earth may have shifted its spin axis over time. The solar day on Venus is 117 Earth days, and Venus rotates much too slowly to generate a magnetic field. Venus is also between the Earth and the Sun, so we will see it in transit, as we did with Mercury. However, they are much rarer. Transits of Venus occur in pairs, with more than a century separating each pair. We had one on June 8, 2004, but the previous one was in 1882, and it lasted six hours. The next one was happened at June 8, 2012, and it lasted six minutes. This shows a photo of the 1882 Venetian transit, where we see Venus um, as a black spot moving across the sun. Here are pictures of the Venetian transit in 2004, where again you see the black spot on the surface of the Sun. That leads us to the last terrestrial planet, Mars. It's smaller than Earth, half the diameter, eighth of the volume, and it's cooler since it's 50% further away from the Sun, and Mars' gravity is 0.4 that of the Earth's. So our 180 pound guy is going to weigh 72 pounds on the surface of Mars. There are some interesting coincidences between Mars and Earth. Its day is 24 and a half hours long instead of our 24, and its inclination is 24 degrees instead of our 23 and a half degrees. So Mars has seasons and days like the Earth, although its year is nearly two Earth years long. So it will have a six month long summer, six month long winter, six month long spring and fall. Mars has been extensively photographed by the Mariner, Viking, and Mars Global Surveyor spacecrafts. On a warm day on Mars, the temperature can hit up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and winds sweep dust and patchy ice crystal clouds through the sky, it's generally clear enough to see its surface from the surface of the Earth. We have sparkling white polar caps contrast the reddish color of most of the rest of the planet. There's a large rift running along the equator stretching a thousand kilometers long, a hundred kilometers wide, and ten kilometers deep. It's called Valles Marineris. This canyon, named after Mariner, dwarfs the Grand Canyon and would actually span the entire United States. The polar ice caps change in size with seasons, because Mars' tilt is similar to Earth's. So a thin atmosphere creates more severe extremes in the seasons, leading to large ice cap size variations. The southern ice cap is mostly dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. And its diameter varies from almost 6,000 kilometers in the winter to only 350 kilometers in the summer. The northern cap shrinks to about 1,000 kilometers and has a surface layer of dry ice, but is primarily water ice and has separate layers indicative of climate cycles, including ice ages. The water contained in Mars's caps is far less than that in the Earth's ice caps. The Martian poles are bordered by immense deserts with dunes blown by winds into parallel ridges. At mid-latitudes, there's a huge upland called the Tharsis Bulge. And it's dotted with volcanic peaks, including Olympus Mons, which rises 25 kilometers or 15 miles above its surroundings, and makes it three times higher than Mount Everest is on Earth. It's 370 miles wide at the base, and you could drop, drop Manhattan into the crater at its peak. It's believed to have formed as hot material rose from the deep interior and forced the surface upward. 
and there's hardly any impact craters on it, which says that the age of it has to be no more than 250 million years. It may have created the gigantic Valley Marineris. Olympus Mons is the largest mountain in the solar system. If we were to look at sea level, <clears throat> um, Mount Everest is 5.5 miles above sea level. Olympus Mons is three times higher and much wider than Mount Everest. Now, from the winding terrain of features that often contain islands, it is inferred that water once flowed on Mars. There is no surface liquid present currently. However, we see huge lakes and small oceans that thought to have existed, and the evidence from these come from smooth traces that look like old beaches around the edges of craters and basins. It's a picture from one of the surveyors of the morning. We have frost in the morning. This isn't water frost. This is all dry ice or frozen atmosphere on the surface of Mars. Other pictures taken from above show objects like this, which is an ancient lake that dried up over large periods of times. Or things like splash craters. Here we have this crater that formed the large peak in the center, but we don't get rays that come out. We get material that's squished out, looks like someone stomped in mud, and you get the splash zone around it. Now, clouds and windblown dust are visible evidence that Mars has an atmosphere. Spectra show the atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide with traces of nitrogen and a little oxygen and water. However, it's a very tenuous atmosphere. The atmospheric density is only about 1% that of the Earth's. So, on the surface of Mars would be similar to our atmosphere at 100,000 feet. The lack of atmospheric density and Mars's distance from the Sun make the planet very cold. Noon temperatures at the equator reach a bit above freezing point of water. Nighttime temperatures get down to 67 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Thus, most water is frozen, locked up either below the surface as permafrost or in the polar caps as solid ice. Clouds are generally made of dry ice and water ice crystals and they're carried by the winds. As on Earth, the winds arise from the warm air that rises at the equator and moves toward the poles and is deflected by the Coriolis effect. Winds are generally gentle, but can strengthen and carry a lot of dust. No rain falls despite the clouds. The atmosphere is too cold and dry. We can see fog in the valleys and ground frost has been observed. And CO2 snow, or dry ice snow, falls on the poles during the winter. The dry riverbeds indicated that liquid water flowed in Mars Pass. That means it had to have a denser atmosphere or a higher pressure to prevent the fast vaporization of surface water in the atmosphere. Cratering indicates that this thicker atmosphere disappeared about 3 billion years ago. There are two ways that lost, Mars lost its thick atmosphere. One could be that Mars was struck by a huge asteroid that blasted the atmosphere into space. Two, that Mars' low gravity, coupled with low volcanic activity, produced a net loss of gas molecules into space over the first one to two billion years of its existence, decreasing the effectiveness of the greenhouse effect to maintain a warm atmosphere. The Mars' interior is differentiated like the Earth's interior into a crust mantle and iron core. It has a mass somewhere between that of dead Mercury and the lively Earth Venus, implies Mars should be an intermediate tectonic activity. Numerous volcanic peaks and uplifted highlands exist. Olympus Mons and other volcanoes do not show any craters on their slopes, indicating they still may occasionally erupt. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. They're about 20 kilometers across, or around 12 miles, and are probably captured asteroids. Their small size prevents gravity from pulling them into spherical shapes. They're both cratered, implying bombardment by smaller objects. 
Now, interest in life on Mars grew enormously with the misinterpretation of observations made by astronomer Giovanni Scarpielli in 1877, who called certain straight-line features on Mars canali, meaning channels. Well, the English-speaking countries interpreted this as canals, and the search for intelligent life on Mars began. Spacecraft photos later revealed the features on Mars were natural land structures. The Viking spacecraft landed on Mars to search for life up close and found no evidence. In 1996, a meteorite was found on Earth that we knew came from Mars, and we could tell that by the, um, by the ratio of elements in the meteorite. And certain structures suggested fossilized bacteria in the meteorite. Today, most scientists are still unconvinced that this is not just some sort of crystal formation. So why are the terrestrial planets so different? Why does Mercury have no atmosphere? Venus has sulfuric acid clouds. Earth has nice water clouds. And Mars has hardly anything. What makes them all so different? Some of it's the role of mass and radius. Mass and radius affect interior temperatures. That, in turn, determines the level of tectonic activity. Low-mass, small-radius planets will be cooler inside and hence less active than larger planets. This relationship is, in fact, observed with Mercury, the least active, then Mars, then Venus and Earth. Internal activity also affects the planet's atmosphere since volcanic gases are the most likely source of materials. Low-mass Mercury and Mars will have a smaller source of gas than Venus and Earth, and the low surface gravity of these small planets also means they will have trouble retaining the gases they receive. Mars, Venus, and Earth all probably started with CO2 atmospheres and traces of nitrogen and water, but were then modified by sunlight, tectonic activity, and in the case of Earth, life. Sunlight warms a planet in a manner that depends on the planet's distance from the sun. The closer, the warmer. The amount of warming depends on the amount and makeup of the atmospheric gases present. Solar warming and atmospheric chemistry will also determine the structure of the atmosphere, which may feed back into the amount of warming that occurs. For example, warmer Venus lifts water vapor to great heights in its atmosphere, whereas cooler Earth, water condenses out at lower heights, and the upper atmosphere is almost totally devoid of water. The great difference in water content of the upper atmosphere of Earth and Venus has led to drastic differences between their atmospheres at lower levels. Water at high altitudes in the Venetian atmosphere is lost because of photodissociation. Solar UV light breaks the HO2, H2O when the H, the hydrogen, escapes into space. Venus, as a result, has lost most of its water, whereas Earth, with its water protected at lower altitudes, has not. The water near Earth's surface then makes it possible for many chemical reactions not found on Venus. For example, CO2 is removed from the atmosphere because it dissolves in liquid water. Biological processes also remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. The dissolved CO2 in ocean water is used by sea creatures to make shells, calcium carbonate, and when they die, their shells fall to the bottom of the ocean, forming a sediment. The sediment eventually changes to rock, thus a lot of the carbon dioxide is tied up in rock for very long periods of time. With CO2 so readily removed from the atmosphere, mostly nitrogen is left. Now some CO2 is recycled back as subduction takes some of the things at the bottom of the ocean down and it melts and causes the CO2 to become a gas again and comes out whenever there's a volcanic eruption. Green plants breaking down H2O during photosynthesis is very likely the reason Earth's atmosphere has a high oxygen content. Now, twin rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on the surface of Mars and returned an amazing amount of data. And we have a new larger rover on Mars right now. Rock outcropping at the Opportunity landing site is thought to be material deposited at the bottom of an ancient ocean which is why we landed there to look for signs of life. 
a close-up image of the rock at the Opportunity Landing Site, and provides uh, it's possibly formed from sediment in flowing water. This image from Mars Global Surveyor, a Mars orbiter that ended its mission in 2007, shows this flat-topped mesa on the surface of Mars. And here we have a view from that of a what appears to be a dried-up river delta. Looks sim similar to the Nile as it's coming out. So the Mars Science Laboratory, or Curiosity, is currently on Mars searching for signs of life. I would like you to watch at this point the NASA MER video. It's a very short, maybe a few minute long video um, showing how um, we send we sent the Mars Explorer off to Mars. I want you to notice all the different things we talked about before on rockets. The multiple um, fuel tanks that after we burn those engines they fall off. And how much of this large rocket actually makes it to Mars is a very small part of it. And especially look to see how we landed. It was a novel landing. They used airbags and just bounced to a stop. And how it drove around and looked. And that ends all of our talks on the terrestrial planets.